This is your fortnightly installment where I interview a trailblazing physiotherapist that has shaped the profession we are today. In celebrating their journey, knowledge and insights, you gain the opportunity to plan and guide your own professional journey. My name is Doug Carey and welcome to Physio Plus 10. Out of the 11 rowers we took on scholarship, nine made it to the national championships and they won 17 medals amongst nine rowers. That is Steve discussing the results of his holistic approach on a group of rowers competing at the national championships. Steve is one focused and passionate clinician that has actively sought out and developed his skill set to become a holistic clinician. What does that mean? Stay around and you'll soon find out. It's uh, welcome to past listeners and new listeners to Physio Plus 10. Today's special guest is Steve and Steve's going to have a different accent, which is what I love about this, this whole process. Um, so Steve, let's just start with, can you give us a bit of a background where you grew up and what you did when you were early schooling and that sort of stuff? Sure. Yeah. I uh, originated from Canada, just outside Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Um, so went to high school there and um, through high school and then went into university and spent two years at university studying uh, Wilfrid Laurier University, which is in Waterloo, Canada, again, about an hour from Toronto. Uh, played all my sporting background in uh, Ontario as well, playing ice hockey and uh, progressed through to university hockey and beyond that as well. Um, and then from studying at university, I uh, ended up coming to uh, Curtin University here in Western Australia to study physiotherapy. If we could just backtrack a little bit, were your parents in the health sphere or was it just you were the first one to move into that area? I think I was pretty lucky in that way in that, you know, my whole family was active. And so, you know, my dad and mom were both into tennis and golf, um, you know, always ate well, had good foods in the house. Um, and, and so I think it was representative of a healthy family. Um, and so growing up in that and being very sporty and having brothers and sisters that were sporty, I, I think you just understand the concept of what, what health is. Yeah. And where do you fall in the family structure as far as siblings go? So I got an older brother, Rob, who's two years older than me. And then I have a younger sister, Sue, who's three years younger than me. So I'm a, I'm a middle child. Hey, you joined the clan. <laughs> <That's a> lot, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, now you, like you didn't start in physio. So what was your initial degree? Um, well, it was a really interesting one. I, I kind of went to university to play hockey, which is, is interesting. I, I got in on a Bachelor of Arts, which just means that you can get into the door and try anything you want. And so I had economics and business, uh, psychology, a bit exercise, physiology. And so the first almost two years was trying everything um, and then probably the end of second year I settled into uh, really having a passion for exercise physiology and also geography as well and so my first two degrees I got were exercise physiology and geography. I mean they just don't seem to go together was there some sort of link was there a, a girlfriend that did both the courses at the same time or? <laughs> not, not at all I, I think again in third year when you realize that um, you, you know, I, I wanted to get a degree in exercise physiology. I thought I was very passionate about that and it was exciting. Um, and yet I had enough courses under my belt already that I could get a second major in geography. And um, it's probably a bit more elaborate than most people think. And uh, I found it to be a very dynamic course with some real interesting stuff. And so I, I just pursued a, a double degree that way. Yeah. So you'd say the exercise phys was a deliberate decision and the double degree going in geography was kind of like an opportunistic I might as well make that extra bit of effort and get the double degree. Did you ever think you'd work in geography? No, I had no intentions of working in geography. Yeah, and just as a complete aside and off the wall, what was it that attracted you to geography? Like, I have a concept of what geography is, but that may be wrong. So what was it that really sparked your interest in it when you were doing it? Well, as I said, geography was actually pretty dynamic. Uh, obviously, you, you look at energy conservation and, and uh, you know, world maps and everything that people think about with geography. There's also things like marketing geography that looked at uh, major companies and, and looked at why they um, would locate to certain regions or locations, why they would have plants or facilities in certain locations and relative to transportation and natural resources, et cetera. And so... Um, you know, I found that fascinating. Um, there's also several teachers in that in, in the geography department that were really dynamic teachers and, and drew uh, a big crowd for most of their lectures because they're so dynamic the way they taught. And so, uh, yeah, I guess it was um, it was just exciting to go through, and I, I liked what I was learning. And so, why not get another degree? Yeah, when I started pulling these questions together and having known you from many other conversations, I thought. 
this is going to have so many tangents and trying to pull it together is going to be interesting. Now, you did mention ice hockey was a big passion and probably the primary reason that you went to where you did go to as far as university goes. When I was in Calgary and watched a few games there, it reminded me of Aussie rules based on skates, fast, get hit from any direction, pretty dynamic. What was it that drew you to ice hockey? Was it just a typical Canadian boy in the, in the snow and it's like ice hockey is a natural progression? Yeah, look, almost every Canadian kid will give ice hockey a go at some point. And so I was no different at five or six years old. You get your skates on, get out there. Uh, you have the opportunity to play organized hockey right from five years old, but you can also, you know, every backyard has a rink or every school has a rink. And so there's plenty of opportunity to play hockey. Um, as you said, it's, uh, it's an exciting game. It's fast. Um, uh, there's physical contact to it. It takes a tremendous amount of skill. And, and so I think once you do develop uh, some proficiency to the game and you progress through it, it's hard to give it up because it's just so much fun to play the sport. Um, and then as you get older and the crowds start showing up and parents get involved, uh, you know, it, it becomes uh, not only challenging, but exciting. So yeah, it just, it just grew from uh, being pretty young to, uh, you know, carrying it on through almost my entire life. Yeah. You transitioned from exercise visit and you mentioned earlier on that you then came out to Australia to attend Curtin to do the, the graduate degree it was, I guess it was a grad diploma, post-grad diploma in physiotherapy. Was that the one? Uh, back then, Curtin only had the four-year degree. And so they gave me credit for almost two years of my exercise physiology degree. So I skipped pretty much all of year one, all of year two and launched into year three. Yeah. So was there a particular reason coming to Australia? Like I remember when I did the reverse and went to Canada, it was a big step. Was it a big step to leave home, hometown Canada and come out to Australia? Yeah, most certainly when you're moving halfway across the world, you know, it's, uh, it's a tricky transition. Um, why I chose Curtin, I was looking at pretty much any course uh, in the world that had a, a great reputation. And secondly, uh, was a two-year degree. And so there's quite a few courses in the United States. There was courses in Ireland that were highly recognized. Uh, Wollongong and Curtin at that time were also highly recognized. And, and so I was looking for schools that would either give me credit for what I had done or secondly had two-year degrees at that time. Yeah. And given that, um, okay, so you arrived in Australia, you decided on Perth, you started at Curtin, you would have been nearly well, eight to 10 years older than the other students. Did you notice there was a difference in the way that you related to the course compared to those new grades that's coming out from high school? Yeah, I think most certainly, you know, um, you know having done two degrees, I knew how to go to courses, I knew how to study. Uh, I was a mature student, you know, when you're living on your own, I was here, uh, you know, by myself, I'm, I'm already working 25 hours a week, you know, there's a lot of advantages just to being a mature student. Um, I also thought that, you know, once I got into PRAC, uh, by that point, I'd already had uh, two degree, or pardon me, two careers before that being a strength and conditioning coach and, and working in exercise physiology. And so there's that ability to know how to already consult to some extent uh, to relate to uh, 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 other humans, you know, and cl yeah. clients and patients, um, and to apply the skills as you learn them. And so certainly on a practical component, I was, um, you know, uh, quite a few steps further than some of the younger students. And how did you find that lifestyle change coming out to Australia? Like, how did you feel being in Australia and the climate and the people and just the environment in general? Yeah, it's an easy place, man. I fell in love with Perth in the first month I was here. You know, it took one train ride to Cottesloe Beach and a walk ride on to Cottesloe and go, wow, I'm, I'm home. This is uh, spectacular. Uh, miles and miles of beaches, beautiful, warm weather, skies are amazing. An easy transition. Yeah. And the whole undergraduate study, I guess, I'm guessing that once you got into prac, you really hit your strides and you felt pretty comfortable. It was just a combination of what you already knew plus the new stuff you'd learned. Was there any hitches going along the way? I don't, I don't think so. Um, you know, again, I knew going into physiotherapy, I was going to be a, a private practice physiotherapist. Um, I know there's other students who are tossing up between the public system and private practice, but I knew what I wanted to do right from the start. And by third year, when we got into prax, um, I was already seeking out volunteer work and I was volunteering two days a, a week with a private practice. And I did that for two years straight. Um, so I, I hit the ground running uh, right from, you know, day one. And as soon as I graduated, I felt very confident moving into a private practice. Yeah. So on completing in that sort of graduation ceremony, what do you remember most about being a physio when you first graduated, as opposed to perhaps being a geologist or being an exercise physiologist? 
Uh, look, I was very lucky. Uh, I, I kind of got headhunted by someone who knew what they were looking for. And so I was brought into a small private practice where the owner said, hey, you know, I, I know you've got other degrees and other other passions. And so in this facility, you'll be able to use your physiotherapy skills, but also your personal training skills or strength conditioning skills uh, and exercise physiology skills. And so walking in the door, I was already given the opportunity to utilize all that. Um, and that, that was very exciting for me. Obviously, like most new grads, I mean, sitting down in a room consulting um, for the first few months or the first six months is, is daunting. But again, when you have somebody next door that you can uh, get to come in and help you with complex clients and hold your hand essentially for the first year, uh, I think is a good feeling. And I had that. So I was well supported. But um, I remember just trying to get the handle on, on working one on one with clients and, um, you know, getting the outcomes that they wanted. You're very goal orientated and very focused in all the things that you do what were your sort of key decisions that you were making at this stage like what were you particularly aiming for in, in uh with ref reference to being a physiotherapist in private practice yes look i i made a decision at that time that i didn't want to work five days a week and, and, and push the 40 hour hour boundary as a physiotherapist and so that was another thing that drew me to this clinic where I really only had a room available to me Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and that suited me very well. And so the first thing was to ensure that, you know, I could consult 30, maybe 35 hours a week at most. Um, and then I had four days a week to myself so that I could pursue my other passions. I could really uh, integrate my learnings from university into my skills as a clinician. Um, and, and also it was a grueling two and a half years trying to work 25 hours a week uh, in addition to studying. And so I, I felt like I needed a year or two to, uh, get my health back and, and uh, let my mind rest. And so those were the things I was looking at when I was seeking out a private practice. How long did you stay there? And what did you find that was most important that you gained in those first couple of years? I was with uh, that practice 10 years, 10 years straight. It was, it was an exceptional practice. Um, we had uh, two other physiotherapists, obviously the owner of the practice, and then someone who worked Tuesdays, Thursdays. Uh, she was a skilled clinician as well. Um, Jill Nyman was there. She is a women's health expert. And so, man, that was, wow, what a talent she was. And so to learn from her. Uh, and Greg McClooney was at the back. He was a skilled podiatrist. And so, you know, there, there was 10 years worth of learning there. It was just an incredible facility to be in. And everyone was so kind and generous with their time. And so really, I, on those Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'd come in and learn from the other practitioners that were there, see how they viewed clients and, um, yeah, just just learn. So I was there a full 10 years. So just to recap, because I think this is very useful for new grads, is that you deliberately were working around that 30 to 35 hours, perhaps less, but you're still putting in another 10 to 15 hours of development as far as either learning at home or watching other clinicians or actively seeking out some sort of mentorship where you could expand your understanding about how clinicians manage patients no question and so i was, I was lucky because um you know i had friends that were chiropractors i had friends that were osteopaths and so i'd uh, sit in and watch other um, professions work as well um, in addition to physiotherapists I sat in and watched surgeries. Um, I got a friend, Robert Simons, who's a skilled musculoskeletal medical doctor and watched him consult and treat. Um, so I spent a lot of time, yeah, probably 10 hours a week at least, um, not only studying, but watching other clinicians who, have, who I felt had perfected the craft and saying what makes them so good in the room with a patient. Yeah. And that's something, you know, again, a bit jumping ahead here, but you've continued that pretty much all the way through in some form in regards to your education. Yeah, no, no question. Um, I still free up at least three to five hours per week, typically on average, to go in and sit in with other clinicians and, and watch what they do. Uh, I, I think it's the fastest way to learn. I think you can pick up so many good tips on, on uh, why they're successful, and, and then I try and integrate it into what I do. <laughs> so you've done your 10 years with, was that Jeremy and Jill or just Jill Nyman? Yeah. Oh, uh, no, it's Jeremy and John Nyman were the owner of the practice, yeah. Is that where you were? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yes, a man, a very interesting, a very interesting man. Um, we'll sing out hi to Jeremy too, because um, I remember the first time he came on a dry and course of mine, he said, I really want to do this, but just don't touch me with the needle. I'm so scared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeremy is 
like the character, man. He is a lovable guy. And, um, you know, he, he, a lot of people came to the practice just to chat with him and uh, be entertained by Jeremy. He's a nice guy. He did. So after you'd worked there for 10 years, we just sort of move along your career progression. What did you, what made you decide to seek something different? Like what was the transition reason for you at that stage? Um, you mean progressing through physiotherapy? And, um, and when you left, we, left, when you left Wood, Wood, I think it was Woodlands with Jeremy and Jill, what made you decide to seek something different? Uh, look, I, I think at that point, um, there was no room to expand. Uh, no one was going anywhere. It was such a good practice that I couldn't move outside of Monday, Wednesday, Friday uh, consult times. Uh, Jeremy, it was only a small practice, so it's not one of those situations where you can buy into the practice and, and be a co-owner. It just didn't make any sense. And Jeremy wasn't at a position at that time where he wanted to sell it or anything. Um, I also knew that I wanted to create a, a multidisciplinary practice um, or a holistic practice myself. Um, and so really the point of moving on was to create my own facility and, um, you know, bring other health professionals into that facility um, that, were, as I said, were multidisciplinary. And that's what I did. So how did that come about? That's obviously a big step. What were the stages that you had to go through to get that off the ground? Yeah, look, the first was obviously to map things out and say, who do I want in that facility? Uh, and so, again, with qualifications in strength and conditioning, I knew I wanted someone in the area of exercise physiology or rehabilitation in there so that I could treat in the room and then pass those clients off onto a, a gym floor. Um, so I was mapping out what professionals would be in there with me. And then secondly, it was to then obviously seek a, a space that um, was suitable uh, and then, yeah, it was just opening the doors and, and starting with just myself and a business partner. He ran the whole floor based side of things I consulted out of a room. And then step by step, we, we built into having, you know, 11 practitioners in there, all with uh, different distances and qualifications. And uh, what sort of time frame did this evolve? It ran for a full seven or eight years. Yeah. Okay. And then, I mean, that's that's a big that's like almost the um, the peak of what a lot of physios would aspire to like to develop their own practice model around what they believe to be the holistic type of approach you what are you doing now well um i'm back to to scaling that right down again um you know we made too many mistakes in building that practice that's a whole another conversation but when you make that many mistakes and you build a beast that takes up that much time and energy uh, there was no way to pull it back in or rein it back in. And so after seven years, we closed that, uh, which was in the best interest of myself and the other, other director at the time. And so I knew with a young family, I wanted to pair everything back, put some time and energy into myself and my family. And so I, I've gone back to just being a sole practitioner for three years. And then I'm almost prepared to take that next step again and, and uh, build out again, but in a much more careful and, and thoughtful fashion. How would you do it differently now, having had that experience? Uh, well, step one is uh, don't have any business partners. Um, I think uh, that's a recipe for disaster. And uh, if you don't know what you're doing and it's not well thought out in advance, you're, you're going to create problems. Uh, so I, I think that I, I don't think I'll go into partnership with anybody again. Um, Two, I think that, you know, it's understanding business. Uh, if you're going to be a physiotherapist and you want to develop your own practice, you better know numbers, you better know the accounting side of things, um, and that more revenue doesn't equal more profit. And so um, I'm much more skilled now at running and operating businesses and um, understanding the financial side of things. And so uh, to create a, a stronger business and create a stronger financial model for this new business. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the challenges that we as physios, we come out with this physio degree, we're good clinicians, but whether it be the marketing or the human resources or, or the financial side of it, they are completely whole genres of um, skill sets, aren't they, that you almost need to have. And if you don't, you can be a great clinician, but you can have a failing business, which is makes it a challenge. Yeah, it does. You know, we, we don't go through that as physiotherapists. Um, and so when you're not handed that business model, you're relying on either working underneath someone else um, or you get out there and you learn the hard way, which is to potentially suffer through many years and close your doors or suffer and, and, and have to pick up the pace and understand that you need to know the accounting side of things and the business side of things as well. Yeah, so true. 
Hey, now look, you're, you're a real fiend for um, PD and I know you've done a, a, a bunch of stuff that particularly probably other physios may not consider um, within the gamut of what physio services can provide. <clears throat> and you've become a lifestyle coach and you've also done some Paul Check courses. Can you just explain a little bit around that, like what it is and why you did it and how you feel it's complemented your services as a physiotherapist? Yeah, fantastic. Um, look, as a strength and conditioning coach, if I asked this question, if I put 10 physios in a room and I said, uh, you know, we have an athlete and we want to make them the best athlete we probably possibly can, it wouldn't be hard for a group of physiotherapists to say, you know, get better sleep, uh, eat better food. Uh, we could change the weight training program. We could change the cardiovascular program. Maybe their supplements would help them become a better athlete, you know, that conversation and putting it on a whiteboard would be pretty quick. And a lot of physios would be able to, to load up that board pretty rapidly. The challenge when it comes to, in my opinion, when it comes to physiotherapy is that we become very focused on really the hands-on therapy side of things and what we can do to the human body with our hands and maybe with exercises to change pain or dysfunction. And yet if we had the same conversation about how to get someone to heal faster, not too many of those physios would start to talk about proper sleep, proper hydration, good food, potentially supplements, um, meditation, breathing exercises, et cetera. And so I learned that if I applied the principles that I learned in strength conditioning for high performance sport to a rehab setting that I could get much better, much better outcomes. And so if where people were drinking a ton of alcohol, if I got them off alcohol, their patellar tendonitis would heal way faster. If someone was drinking a ton of coffee in the morning, dehydrated all day long and not sleeping at night, if I could change that, then that was as good hands-on therapy for someone with back pain. And so as I applied these principles and got better results, I realized that if I got in and studied those concepts more, then obviously I'd be a better practitioner. And so that led me to seeking out some of the mentors that I had had for 10 years in the strength conditioning industry, which one of them was Paul Check. He's not only a guru of strength conditioning and high performance. He's also a guru of, of health and wellness and healing. And so he built the Czech Institute and they offer a wide range of courses. And um, I've taken individual courses online. I've, I've flown to San Diego and taken his holistic lifestyle coaching level one, two, three with him uh, and some more advanced um, mentorship online with him as well. You would say that has rounded out your physiotherapy training to provide you with the skill set, I guess, that is more appropriate to an overall rehabilitation process. It's not, it's not very delineated. It's very broad, isn't it? You're covering all the bases. Yeah, look, I, I think if you believe in holistic healing, then it's, uh, again, mental, mental health, emotional health, spiritual health, physical health. And uh, when you encompass all of that, into treating a client, then um, you know you have to have not only an awareness of that, but you have the knowledge to assess it, and you have the, the knowledge and skills to treat or to make behavioral changes in those areas. I, I think you know when you get a highly stressed client that comes in your front doors, we all know that it's going to be tough to unwind them or get rid of high muscle tone or aches and pains. And so you know that's where breath work comes in or stress reduction programs, etc. So again, I think there's many therapists that are talking about being holistic, but maybe aren't sure about how to implement that into their practice. And so I, I sought that out. I knew that uh, Paul was one of those people who had truly operated in that sphere of being holistic, uh, who had under, understanding of all this stuff and had built it into programs. And so I was pretty keen to gain those qualifications and then uh, bring it into my own practice. So yeah, I, I believe you're correct in saying that to some extent that's being a generalist, you know, knowing a, a little bit or a, a middle amount of a lot of stuff, as opposed to being knowing, you know, a, a truck about something, a small, small isolated area. Yeah, and no, I definitely have to put a plug in there too for the the sleep mastery course, because since I've done the PhD in this sleep, and although it was more on the biomechanics, you have to read a lot wider and it's made a huge difference to my clinical practice being able to sit down with a person and just ask a few scanning questions about their sleep pattern, their profile, what it's doing for them. And then sort of sitting back and saying, well, have you ever considered this element because you've got a chronic injury, be it patella tendon, Achilles, low back, cervical, doesn't really matter. But if you're not achieving that sort of stable seven or eight hours sleep a night, then 
almost every system in your human body is going to be suboptimal. And one of those is definitely going to be your ability to recover. And it's made a huge difference in the last two or three years. For me, I've just been staggered the number of patients that have previously I've been either unable to help or they've come to me from somewhere else. And it's been a very, well, I'd call it simple hindsight, whatever, but some sort of changes to their lifestyle, which revolves around the sleep domain. And they've been amazed, the changes they've experienced as well. And I've been kind of amazed in some ways how simple it is to change it. But I guess it's like anything. If you understand it, you can get to that core essence quickly. The change doesn't need to be massive, but the outcome can be because you just understand it so well. So I have to put a plug in there. If you're listening to this and you want to learn about the sleep domain, I've got a course online called Sleep Mastery. Um, and you can either do as a cohort or you can do as an evergreen course. So thanks, Steve. That was a nice little lead and I appreciate that. <laughs> and you've, you've um, found that you can apply that, that knowledge yourself and you're, you're finding that enhancing people's sleep either speeds up the recovery process or gets you those chronic people across the line? Yeah, it's huge. And the, the two, well, there's almost three parts that one is that if someone has pain and they have poor sleep, then they're going to have more pain. So that's an obvious link between pain and, and sleep. The other, the other link between pain and sleep that I wasn't aware of is that if you have short sleeping, like six hours or less, then that is predictive of an acute onset of pain, low back or neck or musculoskeletal and something. And that doesn't matter whether you're an adolescent, pre-adolescent, adult, young adult, teenager, across all the age groups, if you are short sleeping, that is predictive that you will experience musculoskeletal pain. So there's, I mean, and to me, I flip that around and think, well, if we are treating acute pain, then surely we must be asking about your sleep because that's one of the causes of musculoskeletal pain. And obviously if you have poor sleep, it's going to make, if you have a pain problem, it's going to make it worse as well. And then there's a whole world around sleep quality, which is meaning that if you have short sleep or fragmented sleep, it's going to raise your blood pressure. It's going to affect your heart attack and your stroke. It's going to affect your fertility. It's going to affect your memory, your learning, your recall. It's going to reduce your immunity. Um, your, your ability to respond to a vaccination is going to be depressed. Um, you're going to eat more, you're going to eat high calorie food. So whether you're looking at rehab, um, learning, healing, weight control, um, attention, memory, it doesn't matter what system you're talking. If you are short sleeping, we know from the research that across all those domains, it's going to be affected. And we, and as physio is trying to help somebody heal or rehab, we touch on so many of those domains without even realizing it. So it's yeah, sleep, sleep bridges across them all. So to me, it's just a basic first question, even before how much pain have you got? It's like, well, what's your sleep pattern? Because if we don't solve that to start with, we really are walking around with lead boots. It just makes it much harder. Have you changed your intake forms to try and capture that information before they come in the door? Or is that a part of your initial consultation uh, process? Yeah, it's, 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 it's almost like saying, where do you have pain? Or, or like today, how can I help you? That's my leading question. And then soon yeah. after that, once I understand the, the, what the problem is from their perspective, the next question is going to be, well, tell me about your sleep. And I just, there's only a couple of questions you have to ask to realize, is it, is it an issue or is it not an issue? Yeah. And if it becomes, if it's an issue, then it's, then it's like another conversation like chronic pain. We need to talk about this and this and this and this and explain to the patient why that is. And, and once I understand where you're coming from, and you give them a bit of background information about why it's important to their particular situation, then you might go to some questionnaires, then you might do some sort of um, structured online, not structured online, but some structured questionnaire assessment, as well as the sort of subjective questionnaires as well. Yeah, so conversation, quite that they might come in with back pain, and within two or three minutes, the conversation is switched to becoming, we need to talk about your sleep pattern, because that's probably the number one influential factor for you in your clinical situation. And once the patient understands that, then they'll go out with a sleep diary and they'll go out with questionnaires and they'll go out with um, uh, like a CBT for insomnia program. And yeah, so the whole clinical concept has changed from what they thought they're going to be coming in for to what they're actually going out with. And that's, that's what I find is very fascinating. Yeah. Is that well received? <laughs> is that people open to that information? It is because once they understand the logic behind it and they've got this history of ongoing occurrences of pain, you know, they've seen lots of practitioners, they've had no resolution, always comes back. 
they be, they're very interested in that process. As long as it makes sense and it's logical and you, and you can explain to them why this is important and, and that's part of the education process like chronic pain. Um, yeah, they're on board big time because it's, it's a completely new thing they've not, never considered or have given to them before, which is kind of interesting because they, there was a research project done a couple of years ago and they asked, physio, asked the public, what do physios or would you expect a physio to provide you with education about sleep? And 50, less than 50% or more than 50% said that they would hope the physio would provide that education, but less than 50% thought they could or would provide that education. So it's almost a opportunity that we have available. The public expects it, but they don't believe we can provide it. So yeah, it's, and that was, it was, it was an interesting paper because they looked at things. The expectation was higher than us giving acupuncture and these other types of things that we do give them already. So it just seems like the domain of sleep is expected by the public, but really it's not provided and then they're not, they'd be surprised if we did provide it. So it's a good opportunity for us as clinicians, particularly primary contact practitioners with half hour or longer appointments to sit down and actually go through something as important as what is happening with your sleep. But look, we, we really diverged here. <laughs> so Ready coming back to you, you're the one we're interviewing. As a physio, what's your number one goal that you're trying to achieve with your patients? Well, it's in the intake forms I send out to them. And really, I, I put that question onto them, which is I, I want them to think about that walking in the door. Obviously, as a physiotherapist, my first thought is they have pain. And so my goal is get rid of their pain. And But the question I ask them is, well, what would it be a good outcome? If we spent any time together um, as a clinician and, and a patient, what would be you consider to be a, a, a good outcome? And then I ask them to describe that. And if the only thing on paper is get rid of pain, uh, I usually spend a couple of minutes at the beginning of the first consultation to say, well, what does that mean to you? Why do you care if you're in pain? And usually that leads into, well, I can't do my job or I can't play with my kids or I can't participate in an activity I love. And so we realize that the pain is attached to some sort of dysfunction um, or an inability to do something that they like. And I usually extend that further because usually that means that there's some negative emotion attached to being in pain and not doing what they love in life. And when you link those three things together and create a good outcome that has emotion, usually they're more highly motivated to uh, come to treatments, to do the exercises and to follow your advice. And so my number one outcome is to get the good outcome that the client is trying to achieve. Can you just elaborate a little bit more? Because I think that's critical when that first meeting with a patient like I was saying, I'll ask them, what is it you'd like for me today? So I, I've got caught where I've done what I thought they wanted. And then three minutes into the end of the appointment, they say, oh, you talked a lot about this or we've treated that, but actually I really wanted you to look at my ankle or something like that. And you go, oh my gosh, I really completely missed that. So just elaborate a little bit more that first two or three conversation sentences you have with the client when they first come in. Well, again, if you think of why people are seeing as neck pain, back pain, hip pain, knee pain, et cetera, there's usually symptoms involved of some kind. The majority of people are walking in for a symptom. When you treat symptoms, um, there's, there, as soon as the symptom is, gone, if you change their pain in some way, um, you may have got rid of some symptoms, but you ne not, haven't necessarily taken away dysfunctions or enhanced their ability to perform better uh, in the world, whether it be work environments, home environments, et cetera. So I always try to attach any symptoms to a dysfunction that they're having. So when you dig deeper into why they have pain, you say, well, why does it matter that you're in pain? What does it matter if you have migraines or headaches? Almost every patient is gonna say, well, because it's debilitating, it stops me from working correctly and being my best at work. Or I normally play tennis every weekend, but my Achilles tendonitis is stopping me from playing tennis. And if you dig even deeper and you say, well, why do you care if you play tennis? They'll say, well, it's a good social event. I have friends that are there. I get good feelings from playing tennis, whether they describe it as happiness or excitement, et cetera. And so when I write that on paper, I'll say to them, so I'm just making this clear, your good outcome is to get rid of your Achilles tendonitis so you can get back playing tennis and enjoy being around your friends. And I write that on paper so they can see that. And therefore, I bring that up at the start of every single session afterwards to say, okay, I'm just making sure we're on the same page here. We're still trying to get rid of your Achilles tendonitis to play tennis and, and love life again with your friends. And they say, yes. So I then say, well, did all the alcohol last night help you to achieve that good outcome? Or you haven't been sleeping very well. Can you understand why we're talking about sleep this whole session? Because it's been proven to change your Achilles tendonitis faster. 
So you then start to attach any treatment, hands-on therapy, corrective exercise, any supplement or any lifestyle change to their good outcome. And they're more likely to participate and, and adapt to behaviors that are going to help get that good outcome. So you let them tell you exactly what it is that they're wanting. And then through your understanding and clinical reasoning, training background, you link every decision you make, make back to that initial goal that they were trying to achieve. Yes. The other thing I do is I give, I make them give a score to 10, which is how important is that outcome? You know, is it a 10 out of 10 or is it a three out of 10? If it's only a three out of 10, you say, it's really not important. Is it for you to, to get this good outcome? And so when you give that one exercise for them to do each day, they come back in, it's highly unlikely that they've actually done it. So you, you want to make sure whatever that good outcome is motivating to them, there's enough pain or a, enough dysfunction that they're willing to listen and participate in the course of treatment to, to get that good outcome. And just for argument's sake, if you only get a three out of 10, do you then dig again and say, well, why are you here? If it's only three out of 10, is there something more or is there something recent or is there something else to this process that we need to, I need to understand because it doesn't seem like that's enough of a motivating factor for you to come in to see me. 100%, 100%. You would know, Doug, you're a very skilled clinician. You would know that uh, when, when uh, treatments are successful and they get a good outcome they want, they go away thinking they did the whole thing. And when it fails because they haven't participated, they look at you, the therapist, and say, you suck as a therapist. <laughs> Um, and so our reputation is based on good outcomes. And I don't, I don't play with people that are three out of tens or five out of tens. If, if it's not a seven out of 10, it means I have to ask why they're sitting there. Why are you sitting in front of me? Why, why are you here if you're not really motivated to participate in this process? Because yeah, we can do hands-on therapy and we can get stuck into them. But you know, they be, in most cases, people behave themselves into the scenario that they're in. And although we can help, they need to behave themselves out of that same, that same pain state. Yeah. Looking across your patients that you've seen the last few weeks, what would you say is the most common piece of advice you've been given in general to them? Ooh, good question. Look, I, I'd, I'd probably go with the nutritional side of things uh, and emphasizing that what you put in your mouth uh, is going to play a major role uh, in, in healing. Uh, similar to sleep being so critical to the healing process, so is nutrition. And, and so uh, I usually get into just basic stuff like just whole food eating and say, uh, you know, if you can shift and, and, and shift away from processed foods and toxic foods like alcohol and sugar and coffee and, and other things that may delay healing, we're going to get through this a lot quicker. And so I, with almost every patient, I go through lifestyle factors such as sleep, but also through nutrition. And I know you've got a seven out of 10 person sitting in front of you, but how well do they receive advice on nutrition, like minimizing their alcohol consumption or backing off on the cigarettes or staying away from the polonia tomato white bread sandwiches? Look, I think I'm similar to you in that, you know, you've got such a good reputation that people are referred to you because they've been failed. They failed with other practitioners or, they haven't had successful outcomes other places. So when they come to you, uh, it's on a referral basis. And it's the same for me. Uh, often now I don't really market much anymore. I've got other practitioners referring to me or it's word of mouth. And so most people are pretty highly motivated when they walk in my front door. Um, also after 20 years of doing this, you start to think to yourself, you know, if I only did one thing with them, if I only made them change one thing about their nutrition, what would it be, have the biggest impact? And so I don't have to say, okay, as of tomorrow, we're eliminating every processed food, alcohol, and everything else, because that's pretty daunting for most people. And so you start with, okay, how about if we change one thing? How about if we uh, simply removed alcohol for seven days? Is that practical to this person? And if they did, it would have make a major uh, change to how, how they healed. And if the answer is yes, and they're willing to do it, we'd make one simple step. If that seems too daunting and alcohol is a problem, then we would, we would find another step. But there's no question, there's a massive amount of emotion attached to food. And many people are using food to relax or for enjoyment or um, to get the good feelings they want in life. And if you take that away, um, then you know there's a lot of con consulting or, or counseling behind that. And so again, I pick up on that pretty quickly in the first uh, session or the first few sessions. And people where I think it's going to be an issue, I probably don't bring it up in the first few sessions. I, I wait until there's 
uh, a rapport that's built between myself and the, and the client. And secondly, I've made uh, already improvements in their pain and dysfunction. And so they're already on board. They already trusted me. And, and then I bring in the, the big guns. <laughs> the heavy movers. As, as a physiotherapist, yes. as a clinician, what would you say has been one of the hardest lessons you've had to learn? Uh, good, great question. Uh, I'd probably say that, um, you know, as a highly motivated person, I always want to give 100%. And for me, 100% sometimes is meant giving too much information, giving too much in the first few sessions and scaring people off. And so what I had to learn is that if, if the person across from you is in a position where they're only going to give one or two out of 10, in other words, they're not coming in highly motivated and they're not coming in you know, ready to make every single change in the first week, then you have to meet them with that same level of care and that same level of commitment. Otherwise, you're going to burn yourself out or you're going to push them away. And so when clients hit the ground running, you run with them. When clients walk in and want to walk through the process, you go slowly and you meet their pace. Yeah. And that's a bit of a challenge when you can see so much potential in the person sitting in front of you, but they're just not wanting to move at a pace that you think is reasonable for them. I think it's also hard if they're expecting results, but they're not wanting to run. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like they're sort of saying, why am I not improving quicker? And you feel like saying, well, that's because the changes that you make are so small or there's some big ones that you're avoiding and you kind of, you know, hobnailing yourself as far as your health and rehabilitation and progression is, is talked about. Yeah, and that's why I think when we had this discussion previously, um, you know, I, I brought up that um, you really have to meet them halfway or meet them where they're at. And, and um, I think it's part of not of being a great clinician isn't just about hands on therapy. It's about um, how do you communicate? And, and so that's another lesson is that I wish I had brought it, studied the behavioral sciences and the counseling side of things much earlier in my career, probably in the first year or two, because it's as much as how you communicate with your patient and how you read their body language and how you pick up on those subtle cues that gets the good outcome as it is any hands-on therapy you do. And yet it seems that a lot of the courses that we take are emphasized on uh, putting a needle in somebody and how accurate you are with that, or how do you adjust the spine or how you tape or something like that. And, and less emphasis is put on, well, how do you sit across from a human being and relate to them? Because you get a hundred people walk through the door and they could all have different personalities and motivations. And if you can't relate to it and you try and hit, you know, them all with the same information, the same approach, it's not going to be successful most of the time. Yeah. And that's that personal skills. And that's, I think that's why older clinicians in general probably are a little bit better because they've had that, A, the personal life experiences and B, they've had lots of so-called failures in, in the communication and realize that they, it's not a natural thing. You actually have to learn it. You have to practice it. You have to finesse it. And that really comes with a lot of experience. So whilst we're talking about that sort of the challenges of being a, a clinician, has there been a time in your physio profession where you've wanted to stop being a physio and you just decided you wanted to walk away and become a geologist? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I have. Um, I, I think like many physios, when I got out there, I, I felt or I didn't realize that you could change the uh, clinical setting to suit your own needs and for the benefit of the patient. And what I mean by that is, I walked out the door, I was taught in the first year that you consult for 40 minutes, first consultation, you then immediately drop to 20 minute consultations. And that's just how you practice. And I found myself scrambling through the first 40 minutes to try and get all the information assessed correctly and provide treatment inside of 40 minutes. And then I found myself running from patient to patient every single 20 minutes thereafter. And um, that was frustrating in the sense that I knew if I had more time and I took my time, I would probably have a better outcome. Um, and so it took several years before I realized, why am I doing this? And it was a, a highly skilled clinician who was doing things differently. And he was doing hour long consultations uh, to begin with. And then he was doing anywhere from 20 minute to 45 minute follow up consultations as needed, according to the complexity of the, the pain or, or the client that was sitting across from him. And I said, in my head, I said, can you do this? Can you change things to suit your own needs? And he looked at me like confused saying, of course you can. And from that day on, um, I, I changed that um, and, and got better results. And I was much happier in my career. Um, it was also the day where I realized, you know what? You can put a cancellation policy in place and you can charge people for not showing up. 
And that all occurred because it was it was interesting. I saw a client at the shopping center the one time and I said, hey, you didn't show up this week. Um, you know, why didn't you come in? And they said, oh, I realized I had double booked my hairdresser with you. And I said, oh, okay, well, why would you go to a hairdressing appointment? You go, oh, you get charged. You get charged if, if you don't go to the hairdressing appointment. And I realized that's why they went there because they would have got charged the full consult fee to go see the, if they didn't see their hairdresser and I didn't have cancellation policy in place. And so the next day I was in writing with my lawyer, a cancellation policy that everybody signed. And if you didn't show up, you're getting charged the full cancellation fee, 100% of it. Um, and it was one of the best decisions I've ever made because at that point I was averaging anywhere from 16,000 to $21,000 a year in uh, missed consultations, either moving, you know, calling an hour before and moving it back a day or two or a week later, or just not showing up at all. And it was uh, averaging roughly $20,000 a year. And as a small practitioner, you're just like, I can't keep this up. Yeah. It's funny how we can get into a routine and not realize that we had the flexibility as a practitioner to change that. And I, when I was in Canada, I, I think that really hit me because back in the day, Australia was very much, you know, 60 and 30 type minute consultations, initial and subsequent. And you even had HBF had a different rebate fee for different things like that. And then I went to Canada and I was doing pracs with some people that would have an hour follow-up and other people that have a 10 minute follow-up. And I just thought, my gosh, you know, you really do have to get out of that mindset of saying, this is what you need to do. It's rather than this is, what is right for you and i think that also goes a bit with personality too some people like the shorter sharper more frequent type appointments um, and some people like the more long in-depth um, appointments i think you just got to find out what sort of suits your clinical practice and what the what sort of clinician you are as well mm, yes broadening out a little bit can you tell me sort of three things that sort of stand out for you, like peaks or highlights in your professional career? Hmm. Uh, peaks, um, certainly opening the previous business, Body Genius, and getting that going and, and seeing it flourish into having such a good reputation as a multidisciplinary practice, that, that was a highlight. Um, as many challenges as there were, we also helped a lot of people. Uh, I achieved my goal of having a kind of a one-stop shop uh, for sporting athletes uh, in and having all bases is covered. I also had uh, a Cairo, two Cairo, uh, one Cairo uh, physio and osteopath all working under one roof together and synergistically, which I, I thought was very unique to have that and achieve that. Um, and so that whole concept of body genius and the uh, multidisciplinary center, that, that was a highlight for sure. I think within that as well, um, you know, you have all these principles and concepts and you apply them to individuals, individual athletes or individual clients. Uh, one of my clients was Ross Brown, who was head of rowing WA at the time. And he allowed us to have take 10 scholarship rowers. Um, they're all um, not with waste, but they were all, you know, state level rowers. And we had nine months to prepare them for the national championships. And out of the 11 rowers we took on scholarship, nine made it to the national championships and they won 17 medals amongst nine rowers. And as I said, it was a nine month or a 10 month period where we could apply all the principles that we've been studying for years, everything from nutrition to training to hands on therapy. Uh, we had an altitude chamber and we put all of that together to really bring out some outstanding performances. Um, and that was exciting. It was exciting to prove your concepts and, and to see the, uh, the end result being so successful. Uh, and I think the other highlight probably was, um, you know, getting over to the U.S. and, and, and spending 70 hours in a course with, with Paul Cech. Um, it's hard to describe just how brilliant he is as a clinician. Um, and it, it, it just uh, solidified everything for me at that time. I think I was ready for that course. It was very intense. But having practiced for nearly, you know, 12 to 15 years at that point, uh, having a couple of degrees under my belt, I, I felt that I... You know, I was able to excel in that 70 hours um, and I came back a, a much, much stronger practitioner uh, from that experience. And so that was a highlight for me and uh, it really set up the next uh, five years of my career so far. Was that leading into the formation of Body Genius or were you already in Body Genius and ap applying some principles but not just that sort of structure to it? I was already in by genius we're probably four or even five years into by genius when i went and began and took that course and so i i applied it at body genius and then I've, I've continued to apply it in the last three years in my my current private practice setting as well yeah if you could step back 
jump in the TARDIS and speak to your younger self, what sort of three bits of advice would you like to pass on to your new clinician starting out with the knowledge that you have now? I think set yourself up to win. And so the first is you're about to walk, if you're a new grad and you're coming out the door, the first thing is to, you know, meet the standards of, of what you need to live, the, the minimum salary you need to live. But outside of that, the first thing you want to do in a, for the first year or two is um, be in a practice where you have really good mentorship um, from other skilled clinicians around you. Um, and also negotiate with them to say, hey, if, if I'm in here 40 hours a week, it's very difficult for me to then uh, apply what I'm learning or to seek mentorship outside this practice. And, and so you want to leave some hours at, at least four hours a week where you can get out and watch other skilled clinicians practice uh, and work with clients because you're going to learn far more that way than you are just uh, treating consistently or with your head in a book. So that's probably the first thing I'd say to myself uh, as we discussed, secondly, recognizing that set yourself up to win, which means um, create the environment the way you want it to. If you need longer consultations, make it longer consultations. If you need shorter, that's fine too. But make sure you're in a position where you're happy. You, you've got the time to really work well with clients um, and, and get the outcomes that you're after. Otherwise, you're going to burn out very quickly. You're not going to enjoy what you're doing. Um, and, and I think the, the second or the last thing, the third thing is to really study widely in the sense that a lot of physios burn out because they think it's so isolated to just hands-on therapy when they don't recognize that there's an endless amount of learning that could be done. Um, you know, you, you've taken on a, a master's or a PhD in, in sleep study and it's like, wow, I mean, that's going to help our whole profession um, by having that knowledge now. Um, and the same way you can study sleep, you can study nutrition, you can, you can get advanced qualifications in movement therapy, uh, there's an endless amount of qualifications and study you can do, and you can shape the career any way you want so that you remain passionate about this. Don't, don't you're limited to just one-on-one uh, -on -one consultations with hands-on therapy uh, in a room and just mobilizing and releasing for the rest of your life because um, that can get boring. <laughs> Absolutely. Um Currently, what would you say is your number one resource for information or um, keeping yourself updated? Um, I, I, because I drive a half hour to work and back, I've got an hour on the road each day. So I've got a, a long list of podcasts uh, that I kind of sift through. And, and so I, li I listen to podcasts a lot and, you know, a wide range of things. Um, uh, in, including, you know, not just um, uh, hands-on therapy and chiropractic channels and uh, osteopathic blogs and those types of things, but I, I'm going through a wide range of information to um, hear what other professions are talking about um, uh, and try and understand all this information. So I say blog or podcast is my number one. Um, and then when I'm at home, I've got, uh, again, sites and YouTube channels that I follow because I, I like to watch and, and learn through listening and watching. And so, you know, Paul Check not only has a podcast, but he has a blog, he has a YouTube channel. And then some of my other favorite practitioners have YouTube channels as well. So I'd say probably YouTube and, and podcasts are my two biggest learning tools at the moment. Yeah. And sort of looking forward, what do you see yourself doing in the next five years clinically? Uh, look, uh, we're about to move locations in the next two months and we're moving into a location where I've got a bit more space and I can have a, you know, two consult rooms. And so I'll probably bring on another skilled clinician, um, which will free up a little bit of my time and, and try to evaluate the business model that I want to develop. And so I think there'll be at least a, a one to th three year process of solidifying that, that uh, clinic. Um, and it's going to have, you know, a full scale gym attached to it. Um, so, you know, there's the opportunity to bring an exercise physiologist and link all those same skills together that I've had previously. So that's on the cards. Um, and then there's outside of, you know, uh, enhancing my hands-on therapy and, and what you might call traditional physiotherapy skills. Um, I've been passionate about other areas as well. And so, um, there's a, a really good chiropractic, uh, course I want to take on, on nerves and, and how you adjust the neural system. Um, and that's pretty extensive learning. Uh, there's a diagnostic course in nutrition that I want to take. And, and that's, you know, a lot of hours. That's probably 100 hours to complete that. Um, so there's, there's certainly lots of learning to be done. And again, looking forward for the profession in general, where would you like to see physiotherapy going? 
look, being biased, I, I really think we could own, we could truly own the holistic healing market. We already have a, a, probably one of the best connections to medical doctors that's out there, more so than, than chiropractors or osteopaths they tend to refer to us. Um, and so I, I would love to see holistic healing becoming the focus of physiotherapy. And that is not neglecting rehabilitative therapy or movement therapies. It's not neglecting hands-on therapies. But as you found out, the power in just understanding how to evaluate sleep and, and enhance someone's sleep in the healing process is profound. And so if we, uh, in addition to making it uh, a prerequisite of understanding sleep and, and sleep therapies, imagine if you brought in just basic nutritional guidelines of whole food eating and healthy eating and stress management and breath work. You know, we, we talked about the respiratory system and understanding breathing, but if you really look at it, we've lost that um, ability to, to assess properly breath and to enhance someone's breathing patterns. And now we have breath work practitioners out there that are really taking business away from physios. Um, and they, they now own that space because we didn't take it. And so I, I think that if we're not careful, you're gonna find all these other professions that are taking work that we could be achieving. And, and not from a monetary point of view, but more from a reputation point of view where physiotherapy really could own the space of holistic healing. And it could be the place you go uh, for, from healing from pain and injuries and, and uh, overcoming chronic pain. Brilliant. That's awesome. Hey, Steve, thank you. Really enjoyed a bit of a blast catching up. And also I love the holistic side of, you know, you've really taken it from the practitioners I know you have actively sought out focused and delivered intangible benefits, um, the holistic space. So thanks heaps for joining us on physio plus 10 and sharing your vision. And I hope some people well, a lot of people actually will, will listen to this and be inspired to um, spread their fingers, spread their wings a bit, I guess, and look at when we want to help a person, we need to do it in multiple ways and not everyone needs the same. So we need to have skills across all those domains of sleep, nutrition, hands-on, rehab, exercise, fears, breathing. It's, it's as you say, it's, it's an endless, la endless landscape of learning and you've certainly um, put it out there as to how we can achieve that. So thanks, thanks, mate. Um, have a great day. Thanks for your time, Doug. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Physio Plus 10, in which I trust you gained some valuable insights. It'd be awesome if you can leave your two cents worth as a review or rating of this podcast. And I look forward to sharing the story of another trailblazing physiotherapist with you in two weeks' time. Stay safe. Bye for now.